Welcome to the Intelligent Business Show, a podcast from Aberdeen discussing the latest trends to keep you and your business at the top of your class. And now, here's your host, Aberdeen's CMO in residence, Matthew Grant. Hello, and welcome to the Intelligent Business Show, the podcast that focuses on the ways that organizations just like yours are using data to make their business more intelligent. I'm your host, Matthew Grant, CMO in residence here at Aberdeen. This week on the show, we're speaking with Dan Scudder of Highland Math, a data intelligence platform. We invited Dan to the show to discuss the emerging marketplace for data and how companies can turn their own data into a valuable asset. Let's dive in. So, Dan, welcome to the Intelligent Business Show. Thank you for having me. Um, so, thanks for joining us. And right here in our plush studio, so thanks That's for beautiful. coming in. <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> nice. So, let's just dive right into this. Um, Highland Math... Um, you say, or you call it a di- data intelligence platform. So why don't you unpack that for us? What does that mean? Yeah, so a um, uh, data intelligence platform, we're really a, a neutral uh, intelligence provider to buyers and sellers of data. Hmm. Uh, so in the world we're living in today, increasingly data is becoming a valuable asset that businesses have. Uh, where I come from in my prior company at LiveRamp, uh, data was used for marketing. And sort of the liquidity of data, the, the ability to trade data, monetize data has exploded in marketing. So hundreds of companies uh, making their data available uh, uh, for different use cases. We're seeing that happen in other industries now like healthcare, automotive, uh, uh, financial services. You know, it, the, the list is expanding of, of sort of data markets. Yeah. Um, but uh, what uh, is missing in many of these markets is a, a service that analyzes the way data is being used, scores and evaluates the different data assets and helps buyers and sellers be smarter uh, about uh, their questions they have around uh, the value of data. So that means if you're a seller of data, you want to know things like what data assets am I sitting on that are worth something? Mm -hmm. What are they worth? How do I package them? What channels can I monetize them in? Uh, And then if you're a buyer of data, you want to know things like who's got the best data for my given use case? Uh, what's the right uh, quality of data I should be looking for, um, how should I source data in the best possible way uh, so it's not sort of distributed through several middlemen. Um, so many questions that sort of both sides have, and, and our uh, service provides the analytics uh, to these uh, buyers and sellers of data. All right. No, no, so that makes sense. So you try to help, you help people who are looking to buy data find what they're looking for and companies that are looking to sell their data find, you know, buyers and that sort of thing. Exactly. So, but part of that there too is, as you said, more and more companies just in the course of doing business are just accumulating data Mm -hmm. because everything, to the extent things happen online, everything they're collecting. And that, as you're talking about it, as it turns out, that data, sometimes it's just People just think of it as proprietary. You know, mm-hmm. this is what our secret sauce or sometimes their privacy concerns. We just have to protect this. There's nothing we can do with it. Mm-hmm. But you're also saying sometimes mm-hmm. it could become an asset. Mm-hmm. So kind of what has to happen or what, I guess, uh, what sort of needs to be in place or in order for companies to think of and even be able to act as if their data were an asset for them? Yeah, so that's a a good question. So I think there's uh, a few things that need to happen. One is, obviously, a company has to be collecting data. That's easier than ever, given the way information interacts in digital today. So you have CRM systems, you have uh, point of sale systems, you've got HR systems, there's sort of data being accumulated all over the place. And so first and foremost, obviously, a business has to be accumulating data. Uh, the second thing they need to do is make sure they have sort of the right and and sort of the right uh, interest in mind to to leverage that data. So by right interest, I mean not just uh, the privacy uh, right, but is it in their interest? Can they give up uh, a proprietary edge for something else uh, to gain in return? Um, and I think increasingly with the more companies that want to trade data, there's more upside than downside often in, in distributing data assets for various use cases. Um, And I think the last thing that needs to happen is there there needs to be liquidity in the marketplace uh, for that uh, company's data. Uh, In the marketing world, there's many data exchanges for advertising use cases, for example. So if you have data that can help target advertising, 
uh, the liquidity can be realized pretty quickly on that data. Um, and you're going to start to see that emerge in healthcare and in some of these other categories as well, where there's sort of these middlemen that can take your data and instantly channel it out to the ecosystem of buyers. Um, and, and so that liquidity need is, is very important as well. Mm-hmm. So I guess the one thing you when since you brought up the medical data and stuff like that, mm-hmm. I guess, does it also mean, I guess, since I know very little of, I mean, obviously we sell data as a company, mm-hmm. but... And I know the the data that we've either accumulated or the data that we collect, mm-hmm. that's all above board. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. it's interesting, like, if you start thinking about, like, our employee data or in the case of, like, medical records, mm-hmm. my guess is there's got to be some regulatory limits on what you could actually do with mm-hmm. that stuff. Mm-hmm. But is it still – at the same time, I can imagine there might be ways to monetize it and still stay within the boundaries of, reg- of what's permissible from a regulatory standpoint? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, if you look at healthcare, HIPAA compliance is a huge right. uh, a requirement across the healthcare category. Uh, and that, I think, has slowed down the ability for data to be used, to be exchanged uh, effectively, for there to be uh, sort of universal IDs uh, to help individuals uh, uh, make their healthcare information portable. Uh, so you absolutely have to uh, understand and, and follow those regulations, but companies are building technology that still adheres to those compliance uh, needs, but benefits both consumers and the businesses where data is being uh, traded around. And so uh, the other key thing about data is it's not always data about people that's valuable. Right. Um, there's data about companies. Uh, certainly yeah. Aberdeen knows uh, data about companies, um, but there's data about companies and and just, you know, as a standalone that can be really interesting and not even just for marketing purposes. Um, there's data about places. Uh, so location data has obviously emerged as a, as a, a hot area with uh, mobile uh, devices and, and all of that so you can better understand location. So just uh, not even thinking about data in the context of just uh, data about people sure. but data about other things as well can be monetized. Right. So I, I can imagine, yeah, usage data, mm-hmm. you know, to, I mean, I think when we talk about IoT and stuff like that, exactly. so you have all these companies that are running huge networks and systems, they're generating a lot of data just about what's happening with those systems. Right. Um, and again, it's nothing personal or identifiable, but I think you're right. Like, I don't know if you have any good stories around when a company, like our, some of our data that we sell mm-hmm. is proprietary, and then some of our data is also I guess we would claim to have like proprietary methods mm-hmm. um, of collecting it. But I'm wondering if you have any stories about a company that thought that their data was actually something they needed to really hang on to, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. yet they found use cases where it did make sense for them to you know, put it on the open market in one form or another. Yeah, so um, I would think you can think about uh, uh, like uh, cooperative marketing, mm-hmm. uh, so where companies will – share their customer database uh, and and transaction history into a co-op that's been around for a while uh, in direct mail. Uh, Increasingly, we're seeing that occur uh, in new forms in digital. So companies entering uh, sort of email data exchanges. uh, There's a company that received funding, I forget their name, uh, a week or two ago, where uh, it's sort of partnership marketing for CRM data. And so you can permit hey, you've got this activity in your Salesforce record on an individual, you really don't need that anymore. It's not valuable to you. It's not indicative of anything to you. Right. But that may actually be of use to some other company. Right. And you can just programmatically expose that data to other companies and in return get back data that can actually be indicative of, of something uh, of value to you. And you may not even need to pay money for this. It could purely be uh, exchanging information. And yeah. It's a good good example of sort of liquidity of you've got these digital systems like a CRM system that can easily talk to, you know, another company's CRM and data can move pretty quickly right. between the two. Right. So actually you got me to think about something because I keep thinking about liquidity in terms of how we're going to turn this into cash. Right. That's right. the classic model. But you're kind of talking about it the next either level above or below in a sense maybe when can I actually exchange this data for mm-hmm. something else that's valuable to me, mm-hmm. which doesn't necessarily mean selling it, but the co-op model illustrates that. E- exactly. And so liquidity is certainly cash um, or something that, that can be converted to cash at a later date, which yeah. is like you know some other data point that I can then bring in and will become worth something to yeah. my you know sales and marketing team, uh, for example. And so that, but that ability to 
to use the data uh, uh, that that's sort of being traded around. It, I could sort of consider that the liquidity. Right. No, no, no. That makes sense. And yeah. getting so since liquidity touches on value, mm-hmm. so when a company starts looking at their data assets, I mean, there may be a chicken or the egg thing here because mm-hmm. I was trying to figure out how do you either how does Highland Math go about mm-hmm. it or how would you recommend any company go about evaluating or determining what is the value mm-hmm. of the data that we have available here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, the way we do it at Highland Math is uh, sort of two ways. One, if you're not in the data business already or if you're not uh, sort of making your data accessible, uh, what we'll do is we'll analyze all your existing data and help you uh, sort of cluster it into productizable or, or exchangeable data assets. And we'll do that by plugging into your CRM, your email list, um, we're really focused today mainly on uh, marketing data. Mm-hmm. Um, but we'll sort of hook into all these data assets you sit on without any work from you. Uh, we'll then produce an analysis of here are sort of the clusters of data uh, that you have that are interesting. Uh, here are the potential channels where you can monetize them. Here's what you potentially could expect. So like a forecast right. uh, of impact on revenue, uh, both direct revenue and then also sort of exchanged uh, revenue if you're trading uh, data. Yep. Um, so that's sort of where you would start. And then once you get going, once you say, okay, I want to sort of expose my data and get into the data business, we'll sit on your data uh, sales and data usage and provide analytics on a regular basis okay. thereafter. So you can then tune uh, your business and say, hey, you know, this channel that I thought would perform well for me is actually underperforming uh, why is that? Um, oh, maybe it's because my data is not as good, or you know, whatever it is, and so I want to, uh, you know, make a change and 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 sort of run things differently. Right. And so, actually, I wanted to pick up on something you said there, which mm-hmm. is, um, you know, we'll look at the data that you have and see what's interesting. Mm-hmm. So, what makes? What are some of the things that make data interesting? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, a good question. It it's not always easy to tell, especially if you're the company that owns the data and you sort of get this, uh, I, I don't know the term for it, but you sort of get blinded by your own data and you mm-hmm. don't really always see, uh, you know, what's a value that you're sitting on. Yeah, yeah. Um, so certainly any attributes that you have about uh, purchase history or, or lack of purchase yeah. um, or, uh, uh, you know, funnel uh, that the person came from. So what was the source uh, of the data? What were the behaviors taken along the way? Um, and you can look at that and even if the signals are very small, so you don't need a ton of signals, you can apply some data science to sort of model out and say, well, this person looks most like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, this other sort of behavior that we'll see, and we'll see that across other data that we track. And so you just need some sort of signal that can be uh, matched to some sort of predictive uh, uh, view of, of uh, data sets. Right. Because, um, right. And that I would imagine it also has to do, though, with, um, I guess... Demand and so there's I guess two ways that your platform might work. One mm-hmm. is there's a general demand, mm-hmm. you know, and the, all marketers want to know in my target account list who's doing what kind of stuff. Um, but I think there's also um, this kind of demand for someone's trying to do something, and to do that they need some certain kind of data, mm-hmm. but you might not know about that, or is that also part of the vision for Highland Math that they would be able to help those buyers, in a sense, f- solve a data problem? Yeah, so I guess what we're trying to do and, and what we started to do is look across the demand across many buyers uh-huh. simultaneously and predict, okay, yeah. what are these small things that buyers need? They may seem small when you're looking at them you know, at one company at a time, but it turns out that many buyers need them and sort of extract those little points of value. Right. Um, <clears throat> and so that's that's kind of the the benefit of the ongoing usage that we track ac- across all the clients is we can start to model out what are the interesting signals that, again, to an individual company may seem worthless, but actually to the, the buyers themselves, they're, they're looking for that stuff. Right. Um, <clears throat> you know, B2B data is a great example. Uh, obviously, Aberdeen is is in this where it's like in B2B advertising, a lot of people do their marketing based on industry and mm-hmm. based on job title. Those are kind of like the low-hanging fruit right. uh, selects uh, that people go after. But then intent, uh, uh, which is you know very relevant now to Aberdeen, 
um, is highly important and, and predictive, but intense signals, there's, there's just so many of them mm -hmm. um, compared to industry. I mean, industry, there's like a discrete, uh, uh, you know, set of industries uh, that are out there. So being able to understand what intense signals are you sitting on, matching that up with the demand side for those same intense signals can be really hard if you're doing it in a silo. Right. And so you, it's funny because one of the things that you had mentioned before, it had me thinking about the intent side of things because it's funny you said there's so many intent signals. Part of what I've been thinking about is, yeah, what, first of all, what constitutes an intent signal mm -hmm. really? And then are there other, what signals are kind of, the, which are findable or noticeable in principle and mm -hmm. which ones aren't kind of like a personal conversation between two people. You know, I think we should go with this. If there's no digital trail, I have no idea right. that the intent was just signaled there. Um, so, yeah, the, so the way people basically are doing going about this has to do with either on a co-op model or a walled garden model or using bitstream data, mm -hmm. trying to see what's happening out there in the world. But something I hadn't thought about, which you were kind of talking about, was, well, what if I knew that a salesperson from some other company had actually talked to them? Right. I mean, so that's – so you're saying, like, again, with this kind of CRM sharing data that getting these intent signals that are actually buried in someone's CRM mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. going to be on the market at some point? Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. that's a perfect example of, of something that could happen, whereas you're, you're a, a, an average – a uh, company with average salespeople doing your thing, yep. you're sitting on these intent signals that you have no idea that they're worth something. And they're worth nothing to you, and you assume right. they're worth nothing to anybody else. Right. But we could look at that, and we could instantly say, hey, these are actually super valuable. Yeah. Um, if you expose them in this way via this channel, maybe it's a, right. a, a, a sort of co-op or partnership marketing model, or you can put it up you know, publicly listed on a, a data exchange yeah. or marketplace. Right. Um, you could earn, you know, X amount of money or get X amount of value. That's what we're trying to help companies with. Right. Yeah. And so that comes down to, right, so it's interesting going back to this liquidity issue, which, mm -hmm. again, part of it, forget about the money for a second. Mm -hmm. It's really just can I exchange this? So really what makes an asset liquid is, in a sense, finding someone who's interested in it. Pretty much. Yeah. And, and finding enough <laughs> <laughs> enough instances of that where they yeah. scale. So. I would say like a liquid market has enough sort of scale of buyers and sellers where right. it's like uh, – it's almost like a stock market where you, you're pretty confident yeah. that if you put in a, a sell order, you know, there's somebody on the other side who's yeah. going to pick it up right, uh, right. fairly quickly. Right. So I, so that's what Highland Math wants to be mm -hmm. in a sense. Mm -hmm. So I was curious because I don't – I know – painfully little actually about these data exchanges in general. Mm -hmm. So what uh, what is the kind of status of the living, breathing kind of marketplace for data right now? Yeah, so it's it's certainly in, in marketing and advertising, it's been yeah. around uh, for a while. So, you know, at least a decade there have been companies that have been created uh, for the purpose of exchanging data for digital advertising. Many of those uh, are now owned by large uh, companies, you've got like Oracle Data Cloud, Salesforce Marketing Cloud. Um, uh, you know they're operating with data and helping companies better manage their uh, data. Um, we're starting to see uh, other uh, data marketplaces emerge um, that are uh, some of them even working with the blockchain to help uh, sort of verify downstream data usage to make sure data is used uh, in sort of the way it was agreed upon. Uh, but you have companies uh, like uh, Dawex, D-A-W-E-X, which is uh, uh, another uh, data exchange that's not limited to marketing. Okay. Um, they're much broader, and they let you trade pretty much any type of data, but um, Internet of Things data, uh, location data about parts of the world, um, okay. uh, just interesting you know, signals. And they're more nascent, so if you show up into one of those, you may have a harder time finding that liquidity. But the fact that these are emerging and their sort of activity yeah. is a sign of, you know, the future of, of some of these marketplaces. Right. So this is – so I was thinking about this too, and this may be just a totally crazy question. But I think about something like Salesforce. Mm -hmm. So, of course, everyone – you just licensed Salesforce essentially, right? Mm -hmm. And you have an instance that you've set up. 
Does Salesforce actually technically have access to all the data that's being used within Salesforce application? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. I'm sure technically they do. I don't think they have the right you to do yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of things with it, but right. they, they certainly are incentivized to help you yeah. make it easier for data exchange and other things because they see the vast yeah. amounts of data you sit on, and they're in a great position because they'll see... I mean, I don't know how many tens of thousands of customers they have, but they'll see all these data signals and I'm sure would love to help these customers exchange yeah. them right, right. more effectively. And, and that's part of their vision. Right. Or it seems, too, that they could even draw their own interesting conclusions, kind of the way LinkedIn does a little bit. You know, there's all these things happening on the platform and right. they draw conclusions exactly. um, from and, it. And they're, of course, limited to their silo, yeah. which is kind of where we want to play is a, a cross, cross marketplace, cross right. uh platform kind of view of similar stuff. Right. So I'm wondering, so yeah, advertising and marketing because people, they want to know, you know, who's buying what, who needs what, so I can go after them. Yeah. I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about some of the other applications. So mm-hmm. one that immediately sprang to mind was um, we had um, uh, someone on, the CEO of LlamaSoft mm-hmm. was on, uh, on the show, and LlamaSoft does... Uh, supply chain design and planning. Mm-hmm. So they create a digital twin of your supply chain and then they'll run models against it. So that's becomes one place where that's not a sales and market, but they do need to know, is the supplier going to have problems? Mm-hmm. Is this, you know, is, you know, even something like oil prices or there are kind of data, it's, they need data for these models. Mm-hmm. So I was just wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit to where do you think are other applications where someone could sell their data? Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. in a sense, I was even thinking Aberdeen's data may be of interest to them only because there is some demand, mm-hmm. market demand, not individual demand, mm-hmm. kind of data that would be useful to modeling my supply chain, for example. Yeah, and, and I think that's a great example is, is the supply chain is data about companies. So yeah. if you've got you know X number of companies in your supply chain, it gets very complex for obviously larger organizations. Things like what's the credit score of that company? Mm-hmm. Um, what's going on with uh, uh, you know the value of their real estate? Um, you know, any stock data, just data that sort of is readily available and not intuitively exists in your sort of day-to-day analysis of a supply chain. But now that you've got sort of this notion of, okay, there's data science and, and automation and sort of programmatic views of my supply chain being created, why can't I just input all these data streams and see if the signals coming out of these data streams right. actually help me make better decisions on my long-term supply chain? So that's that's a great one. Uh, healthcare is another one. Right. So you've got this mega problem in healthcare, which is the ability for healthcare information to be linked across all the different silos. Oh, right. um, that's starting to happen. So technologies and companies are being created that help data be linked together. So once data is linked together, you could imagine uh, pharmaceutical companies, when they're doing their research on new drugs, they can now open up access to whole new sets of data about different populations and different uh, research groups that may not have been there before that can actually help them improve sort of the speed to market of new drugs, bring down their research cost. And that has a major impact, obviously, on on drug pricing. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I could also see, I mean, so um, along those lines, I was also, I mean, when you went to healthcare, I was thinking about Watson Healthcare and the idea that Watson could actually absorb the tons of diagnoses. Right. And then when you give them a case, they have this more than any human could have in their head. So, but that got me thinking about, also, the possibility of people selling their data because it's going to be valuable to someone who has an AI or a machine learning platform that needs data to train up on things. Exactly. You know? Exactly. I mean, it gets into this predictive modeling, but it's also, yeah, building thinking approaches. Yeah, and that, that's absolutely going to be a driver of sort right. of the increased liquidity is that you no longer need these massive data sets to, to, to extract value from data. Just a little bit of signal Mm-hmm. Paired together with a bunch of other information, you know, you can use uh, data science relatively easily these days to, to uh, extract value from that data. So it's um, that's absolutely a mega trend that's going to drive uh, sort of the, the data marketplace over the next several years. Right. I'm wondering, too, what role government plays in this and mm-hmm. not so much from a regulatory standpoint, but even – as a data gathering mm-hmm. institution, I mean, which on some level is a major 
thing with government. <laughs> so have you run into that too where, I mean, especially when people look for different sort of revenue streams for governments, it seems like their data is something that could be sort of fungible. Yeah, it's it's interesting and I think a controversial topic yeah, because yeah, sure. um, uh, governments – Certainly, were one of the first collectors of data through the census. Oh, and yeah, a yeah. lot of a lot of data businesses were started just by looking at that public census data yeah, and, yeah. and packaging it and then reselling it. Um, and governments have only gotten more advanced at data collection since the, the you know, creation of the census, which runs you know every ten years. Yeah, yeah. Um, so governments are, are huge collectors of data, and I think that's that's only going to increase, especially at the local uh, government level. I yeah. think at the federal level. I think people are going to run into more regulation and more skepticism. Right. But when you feel a local government and the impact that the government can make using that data, I think it's going to become more uh, acceptable uh, for certain things. And then there's a question of how is that data used and monetized? Right. Um, and again, I think it's the government's obligation to use it in a way that sort of benefits uh, the population versus just like reselling an email list of all its citizens uh, <laughs> To, to an email marketer, that may be received right. less well yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. by a population. But you could uh, see, for example, governments uh, buying data on uh, 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 sort of real estate uh, uh, information from like location data uh, providers and things like that. So that actually yeah. helps them better plan their towns or selling traffic data back uh, to private businesses who are looking to uh, develop in town. So that's yeah, yeah. absolutely something that will right. happen. So it does, and this, though I think it does bring us back around to this, I guess, what people, when they think about the data and this kind of privacy concerns, I'm wondering if this then, as data, it's kind of funny, like it almost seems like a generational thing. I think there's a certain number of people who mm -hmm. just assume that the government's collecting or, or someone's collecting all this data anyway, and they mm -hmm. kind of don't care. Mm -hmm. It's just, again, it's like, that kind of if the platform's free, then you're the product kind of thing, sort <laughs> mm -hmm. of. I understand what they're doing and I don't care. Mm -hmm. But as this becomes more of a thing, do you think people will care more? And in fact, in a sense of like, mm -hmm. I want to cut. <laughs> like if you're using my data now, mm -hmm. I do want com some compensation for it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're seeing anything like that out there. Yeah. <clears throat> um I think it's interesting because I think it was a generational thing. Maybe a few years ago, people were like, oh, privacy is for old, old people or something. You know, they're the ones who care about privacy. <laughs> we and, really do. <laughs> and these younger ones are just, uh, you know, they're all over Facebook and Snapchat just sharing their data around. Right. Um, but I think what you've seen in the last year or two is, is actually a, a reverse of that. So GDPR uh, in Europe, uh, you're starting to see things happen in South America. There's talk in California. And so I think there's an increased awareness among uh, uh, younger generations of like, wow, maybe we should have thought harder about putting all our data out there yeah, yeah. Uh, so actively. So privacy is important. I think what uh, is missing is some level of certainty <clears throat> for consumers around what can and can't be done with your information, yep. where the guardrails are. You know, marketing is a, a big area because marketing uh, doesn't uh, sort of have the perception that it helps people in the same way that like healthcare does and, right. and other things. Um, so, you know, we'll have to see how privacy evolves, but I, I would expect that there'll be continued yeah. sort of uh, uh, governance uh, uh, of, of how data is used, especially uh, data about people. Uh, on the topic of, you know, compensating consumers yeah. for their data, uh, I always like talking about this one because I think in reality, uh, an individual consumer's data is not worth very much. And the way they get comp – they're already being compensated for it through things like discounts right, or, right. Yeah. Uh, you know, banking rewards, th yeah, things yeah. that aren't, aren't – and that's an example of liquidity. Like you're already getting that. So if you're willing to give up all these things that you don't even realize you're getting right. and then you want to get a check for 47 cents in the yeah. mail – uh, if a company can find it economically viable to create that business model, yeah, yeah. like maybe that will happen. Right, but right. in the meantime, consumers should expect their benefits. Yeah. They're, they're getting them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so yeah. No, no, that's a good point. But Because I was also thinking, does this, it almost makes it so, like we're thinking about this as a, at the business level, mm -hmm. but I was thinking you could also just bring it down to the household level or something. I can go out, I mean, and again, I understand that on the one hand, an individual, what's happening within an individual household, their media consumption habits, their buying habits and stuff like that, even right. their exercises with Fitbits and stuff like that. Like, 
I'm just starting right now to think about all the data that my household <laughs> spins, <Right>. <laughs> spins <laughs> off. And if there's a way to monetize that, again, it might not be that much mm-hmm. as a person. But, like, if I did it with my whole neighborhood yeah. or a whole town ended up doing it, you know, it becomes something that's yeah, sort the, of interesting. Yeah, the question there is, like, right, where do you stop? Because then it's yeah. the whole town. Then you've got the government right. pooling together everyone's data and selling, which is a fine idea yeah. in, right. in certain uh, regards. But, yeah, it's, it's, you know, for a single household, you have to think about what does your household spend per year? Oh, yeah. And then how much of that is actually, like, influenced by advertising right, and right. versus, like, you know, fixed mortgage payments. And yeah, yeah, there's and a lot like, of stuff they're not – no one's going to care about. Exactly. exactly. So it gets pretty micro and, and, yeah. and all that. So. But um, so is we need to wrap up here. But I'm mm-hmm. wondering, is there any for com- going back to companies? Is there any particular data that companies are collecting just as a matter of course mm-hmm. that they don't think? And we talked a little bit about where someone is in the pipeline. So maybe another example that they don't realize might be valuable, but actually is. Mm-hmm. I think uh, every company sits on sales data. Uh-huh. And sale, you know, because if you're in business, you're selling something yeah. to somebody. And and that uh, information is so valuable, not just about the people who are buying from you, but the companies that are buying from you, the industry you're in, and, and sort of the impact of different trends uh, related to the industry when rolled up across many companies. So just sort of transaction history mm-hmm. uh, can be analyzed in really interesting ways, yeah. um, whether it's, you know, large volume of transactions or, or you're a law office that has, you know, 20 clients a year, um, and just pulling that, benchmarking it, doing different things with that, I think is right. is really fascinating today. Yeah. So. All right, and on that note, we're going to stop. So, Dan, thanks a lot for coming in and joining us on the Intelligent Business Show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Matt. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening, everybody. Next week, we'll be talking with Randy Frisch, co-founder, CMO, and president at Uberflip. We'll be speaking about the importance of content experience. You won't want to miss it. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Intelligent Business Show. You can find this show on iTunes and Spotify as well as on YouTube. And be sure to follow us on Twitter at Aberdeen underscore show. And if you want to know what's going on in your market space, be sure to check out Aberdeen.com.